Now, I'd like to introduce Michael Cordova, who's going to give our presentation. Uh, thank you. So, uh, when my slides come back, okay. Uh, I'll begin by acknowledging the Wathong people uh, of the Kulin Nations, uh, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to the local peoples for allowing us to have uh, our gathering here and uh, to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. Um, it's a small token, but I think it is important. So, thank you. Uh, so I'm Michael Cordova. Uh, my online handle is I say MJEC. Uh, I say Majek, sorry, but everyone else says MJEC. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer. I work in uh, a little town called Hobart. I do uh, intellectual property, privacy, administrative law. Um, I occasionally hack on some code. Uh, I run one EC2 micro instance, so I'm a sysadmin as well. Um, uh, I am the easy count guy. Uh, I tried uh, over the last two years or so to get the Australian Electoral Commission to release the source code of the software used to count Senate votes. Um, and if you haven't heard, uh, we lost. Uh, in December, the decision came down that uh, that wasn't going to happen. We can talk about that at another time. Uh, I'm also an Arch Linux user. I use i3 uh, as my window manager. Um, the slide originally said I'm pretty pretentious, but I think that captures it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> things that I'm not. Uh, I'm not my employer. I'm not up here talking for them. Uh, I'm not your lawyer. Uh, if you would like me to be your lawyer, we can talk about rates afterwards. Uh, and none of this is legal advice. Some of it is general, some of it is not going to be correct, and it's not a particularly detailed presentation. Uh, I'm not a elite hacksaw. Um, I, as I say, do a little bit of code, dabble a little bit, but uh, this is not a highly technical talk. I'm not, uh, I'm not qualified to give a highly technical talk. And despite what the Electoral Commission tried to say, I am not vexatious. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. This is the, the entire talk in one slide, right? Lawyers and politicians do not get technology. Um, and it's really hard to govern behavior that you don't understand. Uh, this is a great XKCD. Uh, you know, when a user takes a photo, the app should determine whether or not they're in a uh, national park, okay? Give us a couple of hours, we can do that. You should also check whether the photo is of a bird. Well, I'll need a research team in five years. Uh, that is the kind of misunderstanding that we see all the time between uh, lawmakers and people involved in technology. Um, law is based on some really old ideas uh, that uh, are really good ideas, but uh, are not necessarily relevant in today's world. So uh, things like the, the idea of the rule of law is really important, but uh, was developed in the 9th and 10th century. Uh, the idea that laws should be focused on process rather than outcome uh, is a, a very big idea in Australian law especially, uh, and that leads to decisions that people say, hey, that outcome's really bad. And as lawyers and as politicians, people say, oh, well, yeah, but that's how it works and the process was fair, so therefore it's okay. Um, there's also this idea that there should be relatively few laws, that the same laws, the same rules should be governing as much behaviour as possible, and that we should abstract away from governing particular behaviours to governing general categories of behaviour. Uh, that works sometimes, uh, but as we'll see, it doesn't work all of the time. The other thing that's really interesting about the law is the processes we follow are the same as they were nearly a thousand years ago. So uh, there's this implicit assumption that we won't enforce every law all of the time. So for example, uh, when it comes to minor infractions like speeding or jaywalking, uh, those laws are passed on the assumption that not every time every person jaywalks or speeds, they will be caught and prosecuted and subject to the full force of the law. They're behaviours that we want to control, but there, there's that, as I say, underlying idea, uh, or that underlying understanding that there's a limit on police resources. And that's increasingly not the case. 
when we have things like pervasive monitoring or technology that is capable of uh, you know, determining, uh, you, know, you could put a GPS in every car and trivially determine when every car is speeding. Uh, that's not uh, the type of enforcement that we're used to in the law. And I think we need to change our approach in order to deal with the fact that we now have the capability for pervasive monitoring, the capability to do uh, absolute law enforcement. To be fair, tech people also don't get the law. This goes both ways. There are good reasons why the law is really technical. Uh, I doubt anyone wants to sit around and read all of these books uh, to learn the law. I certainly didn't, but I did anyway. Um, they are, essentially, a lot of law is only available in dead tree form or sometimes on vellum, which is dead animal form. Uh, the law is complex. Um, and it's not tech neutral. Um, uh, but also, technology is not neutral. Uh, Katarina Mota said in her keynote that technology exists in a context, and I really agree with that. It's really important to recognise that uh, not only does technology exist in a cultural context, there are also cultural ideas that come with technology, where we say things like, oh, tech is neutral, we can use BitTorrent for good and evil, we can use Tor for good and evil, so therefore it's not technology that we should regulate. And that's true. But a lot of people in this room, I suspect, would say we shouldn't let anyone buy a howitzer, even though there might be good and evil reasons to use a howitzer. We have to remember that when tech people approach political and legal issues, we often come at it from the same, uh, from the same cultural background, from the same place. Uh, and that's something that we just need to be conscious of, is that uh, not only is tech not neutral, the tech community is not really neutral. Um, Having said that, I don't think that BitTorrent or Tor should be regulated. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, you know, we are talking about the same kind of damage that we talk about with howitzers. But it's really important to recognise that there is that kind of uh, connection that we need to be thinking about. The other thing is that law can be uh, specific. It can be technical. There are lots of examples of where the law has been deeply technical and remains deeply technical in the public interest. So things like construction codes in countries where they exist, or food standards, or uh, civil aviation or broadcasting regulations, uh, things like the, uh, you know, uh, what is it, the Defence and Strategic Goods List, the DSGL, uh, that regulates imports and exports and goes into an immense amount of technical detail about specific things that are going to be covered. Um, I think that this is good. Where law is specific, we tend to end up with uh, good outcomes. We tend to end up with law that appropriately reflects what it is that the law should be doing. So uh, we'll go and look at a couple of examples of where the law has not done a very good job. Uh, so here's one particular law, uh, the Telecommunications Interception and Access Amendment Data Retention Act 2015. Um, Many of you will be aware of this, the fact that it requires uh, internet service providers and others to attain data on a mandatory basis. Everything on this slide is a direct quote from that law. So on the one hand, it talks about services that will have data retention obligations. And those are services for carrying communications or enabling communications to be carried by means of guided or unguided electromagnetic energy, or both, just in case that wasn't clear. <laughs> this screen is projecting light. <laughs> uh, is it a service? Well, I mean, it's not a telecommunications service. Uh, but that's a law that's drafted with this immense technical detail that's actually quite meaningless in any realistic context. Conversely, when it talks about the information that has to be retained, it talks about the type of communication. And the examples they give are voice, SMS, email, chat, forum, or social media. Now, how does your ISP know whether a communication is a social media communication or a forum communication, uh, short of deep packet inspection? I don't think that the metadata associated with these types of communication is the same. We know that it's not the same. We know that these happen at different OSI levels. 
uh, and really have a very different implication. And if, as the law intend, uh, seems to claim, every service that's involved in the carriage of electromagnetic radiation uh, is, needs to keep every uh, you know, type of uh, communication that is carried on it, that could have enormous implications. Um, also, the type of relevant service. You can see we've got there uh, layer two services, we've got uh, layer three services, uh, we've even got, I don't think, oh, VoIP is you know, maybe a little higher than that as well. So, yeah, they're talking about uh, the type of service as though there's one idea that carries over everything, and again, that's, that's really not the case. The other thing that's a really interesting thought that I had when I was writing up these slides is what does it mean to say a service? We distinguish service from product, right? A modem is a product. But software is defined to be a service in the Australian consumer law because you're granting someone a license that is revocable to use a thing that you've produced in order to uh, you know, perform an action. So there is an argument to be made that all software is a service, and therefore all software producers have data retention obligations whenever their software is used to enable communication by means of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, my point really is that this is ridiculous. Uh, it's really not uh, drafted in a way that makes sense to the people who are required to comply with it. Uh, now, I don't think that every software developer has an obligation to comply with data retention obligations. Uh, but that's not legal advice. <laughs> There's a much simpler way. We have this OSI model, and we can say, actually, we want to target layer three service providers, and we want you to keep header data out of that layer. Easy. That would be a much shorter law to draft, it would be much easier to understand, and it would be much easier to keep. And if you want to say that actually we want Skype to keep details of their communications as well, then make a law that says if you're providing a VOIP service, you're obliged to keep the following particular type of data. And if you want to know when people are making social media posts, whatever the hell that means, uh, then make a law that says that. And that's going to be much more effective. It's going to be much easier for people to understand. It's going to be much easier for lawmakers to understand. Uh, and it's going to be much harder to get around. So, you know, that kind of encapsulation, we deal with all the time in the tech community. It's something that could easily be migrated into law. But it's easy to bash data attention, um, in particular in this room. So let's talk about a different area of the law that's really uh, a little bit difficult. The Privacy Act says that you can't disclose information across national borders uh, from Australia to another country without certain uh, types of permission. And the reason for that is the law is designed to prevent you from just sending your data overseas and then someone goes and gives it to others and they're not subject to the Privacy Act in Australia and therefore you have no remedy. Uh, and the law actually uh, talks about specifically the risk of other governments being able to access your personal information. The trouble is that the use of personal information overseas is not regulated. So if you uh, are not disclosing it to another person, but you're instead using it overseas, that's fine. And if you're carrying it on your laptop or you know, you're a company that has servers in multiple locations, then that's probably OK. But what if you're using Dropbox? And I don't want to pick on Dropbox specifically, but uh, you know, that's a classic example of a use. You put it into the Dropbox folder. It goes off to Dropbox's servers. That's fine. That's a use. They don't have permission to go and take that material and disclose it to others. We've dealt with the problem that the law is trying to address. Except if you look at the terms of service for Dropbox, they actually do have permission to look at your material and disclose it to others in certain circumstances. And if they get hacked or if the government compels them to, they can be required to open up 
uh, the service and provide that information that you've stored in Dropbox. So this differentiation between use and disclosure is designed to ensure a particular, uh, uh, in the language of the law, ensure a particular mischief is being remedied. It's trying to solve a particular problem. But because they haven't taken into account the technical nature of uh, the way those disclosures happen, it's no longer clear uh, where the law applies and where it doesn't. It would be very easy to say, if the bits are going outside Australia, if they're being carried across an international link, there are particular obligations. But when you've got, in particular, as we do at the moment, you have stacks upon stacks upon stacks. You have your platform as a service provider, you've got your software as a service provider uh, that's being used by another software as a service provider, all of which is providing your email or your accounting system. Maybe that's disclosure, maybe that's use. It's not really clear because the law is not drafted well. Something that's a little less obvious to government as well uh, is anonymous data. The Privacy Act in Australia talks about personal information, and this is consistent with almost every privacy law across the world, is that they're all about uh, moderating the use of personal information. And personal information is anything from which your identity can reasonably be inferred. And by identity, they normally mean your name, your government-issued identifier, if you will. Um, that's, don't use that terminology. That's ridiculous. But your name or uh, your photograph or some kind of likeness of you. But if every time you visit a service, you've got the same identifier that you're serving up, some good, then it actually doesn't matter whether they know your name or not. What matters is that they're engaging in the types of tracking behaviours that people find really disruptive. And they don't actually need to know your name or what you look like in order to do that. Privacy rights took a very long time to emerge in the Western world. Uh, they really come from this commercial idea about confidentiality uh, and uh, protection of confidential information. Uh, but it really doesn't deal with the way that the modern world operates. And the world in 2016 involved, or the world in 2012 involved Target, as you may know, uh, determining that someone was pregnant by analysing their purchasing patterns and behaviours. Now that's really creepy behaviour, that's really off-putting. A lot of people found that really off-putting. So Target became more subtle about it. And that's always been the solution is that as long as we don't see how the sausage is made, as long as we don't get to see the way that our data is being used, uh, there's never really an outcry about it. For those of you who are from Australia, uh, Medibank Private, which is one of the largest health insurers here, will provide you with uh, 10 flybys points for every day when your Fitbit records 10,000 steps. Um, so, you know, that's worth as much as five cents a day, and all you have to do is provide them with access to all your Fitbit data. Now, in this room, we understand that that's kind of creepy and what the implications of that might be. And it doesn't matter whether they know my real name or not, whether they know who I am or not. I don't want them to be able to spot my good and say, you know what, that guy probably had a breakup the other day because his heart rate went up. That's the thing that is really concerning, is that the types of behaviours regulated by the law are no longer the behaviours that we're really interested in protecting. Because where the law comes from uh, is, is this idea about th these old-fashioned ideas where privacy meant stepping behind a shed rather than stripping yourself of every electronic device and only talking to people face to face. I could go on with examples all day. Uh, encryption is a classic one. Uh, a number of you will be aware of the number of government agencies whose websites don't use HTTPS. Uh, quick anecdote, in about 2000 or 2001, uh, I thought it would be a really great idea if the government provided X509 certificates, right? You would have a central certificate authority that would be able to provide verification of identity for individuals. You'd have this great distributed uh, system. So being a 14-year-old who was into X509 certificates, uh, I wrote to the Attorney General <laughs> and I said, this would be a great idea. Um, and the Attorney General wrote back 
and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> unauthorized access is another one that's really important. The criminal code, uh, the Commonwealth Criminal Code, makes it unlawful to access data uh, to which access is restricted by an access control system associated with the function of the computer. Uh, so that's pretty opaque. Uh, we've seen different ways that that's been interpreted. Uh, munging a URL to put in a different ID, sending a different get parameter. That's probably not hacking in any of the traditional sense. I don't think, I certainly don't think that that's something that should be uh, criminally punished. But what if it's automated? What if you are uh, going through and downloading tens of thousands of records? What if what you're doing is changing your MAC address in order to bypass MAC filtering? Is that something that should be criminal behavior? What if what you're actually doing is brute forcing through passwords? And ultimately, is there any difference between brute forcing an ID and brute forcing a password? We don't have really well-defined ideas about these things, and that causes problems with the law. Um, copyright. Uh, what does it mean? What does copyright really mean in an era where everything is digital? You hear about things like copyright in a work. Well, and the, the test in Australia when you talk about making a copy of something is, have you made a copy of a substantial part of that work? And that's a qualitative, not quantitative test. If you're sharing on BitTorrent, for example, how much is a substantial part? Does it make sense to talk about a qualitative part when what you're sharing uh, is an encrypted, you know, MP4 stream. Does it make sense to say that a substantial part is not shared until you have the encryption key or the requisite means of access? We haven't answered these questions. And the point is that the legal framework we have doesn't fit the technology as it exists today. We've seen the same kind of thing when we talk about ISP liability and the IINET trial that took place in Australia. Uh, where it's not clear to the, the extent to which uh, the law currently applies. My favorite one is uh, evidence. And if you go and you need to sue someone and rely on an email, my immediate thought is, OK, we need to prove this email was actually sent. So we'll go, we'll check server logs, uh, we'll look at DKIM, we can you know, determine based on past DNS data uh, what the key was, we can show that it was signed by the server, that proves that it at some stage passed through the server. Uh, in the real world what happens is you get a printout from Microsoft Outlook, sometimes copied into a Word document, um, and someone says, yeah, I definitely sent that email. And if that's denied, someone on the other side says, no, I never got that email, and the judge decides who wins. So my only gift in the, in the slideshow. Um, this like, just does not align with the way that we as tech people see the world. Uh, the law hasn't caught up and is not, uh, is, is not effective. So easy, obvious solution. Everyone has to know about technology. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Smattering of applause, that's very appropriate. Uh, I was privileged to see Tony Morris talk in the uh, Functional Programming Mini-Conf on Tuesday. Uh, and he was talking about parametricity. Um, he was convinced that functional programming had already won, and that was a premise from which he began. And he said, everyone should be using total languages. Uh, which I didn't even know were a thing, but they're non-Turing complete languages that have these magnificent properties where you can derive proofs from the type systems. Uh, great idea, magic stuff, really interesting talk, never gonna happen. <laughs> it's the same here. When you say everyone needs to understand the technology they're making laws about, it's this kind of tech exceptionalism uh, that is, sounds ident identical to everyone should only use total functioning, pro total, total languages when they're doing programming, which of course is always functional. Uh, 
it says that technology should be treated differently. Uh, politicians are not experts on mining. They're not always experts on economics or other areas of law. So to say that technology is somehow special uh, is not a particularly uh, easy thing to convince people of. So I don't think that this is an easy solution. Uh, I don't think it's really a solution at all. So <laughs> let's move past this brilliant but impossible idea that everybody should know tech. There's this other idea which has actually been really effective. Um, I've said contracts on the slide, but it's not just about contracts. It's actually a whole branch of law known as private law. And this says that everybody makes agreements with each other and that those agreements will then be enforceable. Uh, so copyright is the classic example of this. Uh, copyright has been really, really successful in uh, protecting particular tech interests. And the great revolution here was the invention of copyleft and the GPL. That, I, I think that, uh, that, that, that's worthy of applause. The GPL uses that existing legal framework to deliver a result that is not necessarily intended by the law, but that is really helpful for the people who are interested in the technology. So it's a great example of the way that existing legal frameworks can be used to deliver things that the tech community is interested in. Things like terms of service and EULAs have actually also been really effective at that. Uh, the idea that uh, you know, th there are particular things that you wouldn't want from a technical or indeed a public policy or legal standpoint, like that people who install software uh, then have an unlimited right to sue others when the software goes wrong, for example. So we developed this idea that uh, end user license agreements or terms of service would restrict liability and would be enforceable as contracts. It's another way that the law has been able to adapt to particular technical circumstances very effectively and has actually provided just enough protection to enable a whole range of internet commerce and a range of internet services. Uh, and much as everybody hates EULAs, including me, and I write them sometimes, uh, they're actually a really important part of the legal protection for businesses that are providing software. P3P is a great thing, uh, if any of you remember this. Uh, it's a privacy uh, protection protocol where, where uh, together with the headers of your website, you would send information about how personal information will be uh, collected and used. And uh, all that really was was essentially making some kind of agreement between yourself and the web, between the server and the browser on a technical level about which policies would be permitted. And the idea was that you'd be able to go through your browser and check boxes as to what you were okay with doing. Um, and then only websites that did that would be presented to you. Uh, it's a W3C standard, so obviously everybody has implemented it. <laughs> Look, private law, as I say, has been really powerful and is really useful, and it's great for libertarians who have the money and power to sue people when things go wrong. Uh, it's great if the internet all happens within one jurisdiction. Uh, it's great when you know who's operating the website on the other side, and they actually have the money or the power to remedy whatever goes wrong. So, in the real world, it's probably not that great. It's been just enough, as I say, to protect uh, the expansion of commercial enterprise onto the web. But it's probably not enough to provide protections for individual citizens. Because if you're in Burkina Faso, you don't want to have to uh, go to a mediation in San Francisco in order to get PayPal to unfreeze your account. Uh, th those type of systems are not effective uh, where you've got uh, small individuals arguing over things that are small for the particular web services or, or companies. I think what we need is laws that are fit for purpose. Laws that understand that an internet service provider is not an IRC server, that those things have different means of operating and should have different responsibilities. Law that understands the difference between VoIP and PSTN and that the type of data that you might collect, the idea of a pen register, where actually everybody has all of this information for their billing accounts, isn't necessarily consistent with the way that we do telephony now. 
when I was in high school, um, in grade eight, I think, I had a science teacher who would say, a rock is not a bloody stone. I don't know the difference between a rock and a stone, but I do know that a rock is not a stone. And that's the point. If we can make politicians understand that technology is sometimes different to other technology, that they need different means of regulation, then that could actually be effective in creating fit-for-purpose law. Sometimes you actually want to focus on the outcomes. Sometimes the law doesn't have to be particular to, te to the uh, technology. Sometimes it's about the particular mischief, as I said before, that you want to remedy. Revenge porn is not okay, and it does not matter what the platform is. It doesn't matter whether that's happening on social media or whether that's happening uh, you know, by MMS or SMS. The point is that that is not okay, and we regulate that behavior. That's different to uh, things like data retention, where it is actually about the medium, where the particular medium you're using does affect the type of behavior that you're trying to regulate, where it does affect uh, the obligations that you are trying to uh, deal with. When we talk about privacy, and I keep coming back to this because it's such a great example, the things that people are concerned about are not just the protection of their personal information, it's a prohibition on that creepy behavior that Target engaged in. And it doesn't matter whether your name is part of that or not, the point is that we're trying to prevent people doing particular things uh, with our information. That's the, the mischief that we really need to uh, deal with. People are always uh, worried about passing a myriad of new laws, oh, we'll have to amend that every year when new tech comes out. Okay, maybe you will. That's actually okay. Parliament sits often enough that we can amend laws if we need to, if it turns out that it's not working for this particular purpose. That's, I think, a far preferable outcome to trying to pass a law that covers every base but is totally incomprehensible to the people meant to deal with it. Sometimes you actually need a radical shift in the legal approach. Sometimes the internet is different to the way the real world operates. I say real world as though it's different. Um, it's really a question of scale, I think. We talk a lot at this conference about scale in the sense of, oh, I have 100,000 servers or however many people have these days, I don't really know. I still only have one. Um, but scale also applies to human problems. Uh, I saw Randy Lee Harper's talk this morning about abuse on the internet. I remember the internet of the 90s where if you really annoyed someone, maybe you'd get mail bombed with hello.jpg, right? Some of you know what that is. Uh, and that would happen once, and it would be really annoying, and maybe you'd have to download a lot of data overnight, or maybe you'd have to find some way to clear your pop box, but that was it. You didn't have to move house. The world is different now because it's at a much bigger scale. There are billions of people using the internet, and that actually changes the calculus for a lot of this stuff. That difference in scale is the same thing that means that we can be pervasively monitored by government now. It's the same thing that means that government can afford to put a GPS tracker in every car. We need to think about what, as a society, we want to do about these problems and find some way to resolve it. I did have a joke about MongoDB being web scale, but we'll move past it. I put up there the US and Corsby. This was a 1946 case that a lot of you have probably heard of, even if not by its name. There's this old common law idea that whoever owns the soil, it is theirs all the way to heaven and all the way to hell. That you own the entire column of air up as far as space goes. And in 1946, a chicken farmer said, I don't want you flying planes over my chicken farm. And it turns out that it's a real problem to have everyone owning their little patch of air column all the way up to the top of the universe. So Justice Douglas of the US Supreme Court said, that doctrine has no place in the modern world. And it was that simple. A decision was made that that idea that we've held on to for, by that stage, again, nearly a 1,000 years, it's actually not true anymore. The world has changed. 
The world has moved on. We need to change with it. That's all it takes. So, you can help. I would really like it if you would help. Uh, firstly, don't ignore the law. Being a tech person doesn't mean that you get to opt out of legal or political discussions. You shouldn't say, oh, look, the law says that, but I really understand the technology. No. Comply with the law and make sure that the law can be complied with. Participate in those discussions. Don't be too technical. As George Fong was saying uh, in the Tuesday keynote, it's really important to have a seat at the table, to be able to communicate with those people who are making the law so that the law can be correct. Don't expect a technical solution. It turns out that most social problems don't have technical solutions. That, thank you. It, it, it's actually not possible to, uh, to, to say, well, we're going to find some technical way to deal with those particular behaviours. We know that that doesn't work, and in particular that it doesn't scale. Think about policy solutions. Think about what it is that you want to actually regulate. I don't want Target taking my personal information and discovering that I'm pregnant before I know that. Well, they're probably not going to do that for a range of reasons. Um, what is the behaviour we actually don't want there? We don't want them compiling large databases, cross-matching information, and using it to divine information about me that I haven't given them. And it's the same with flybys. You know, I, I don't actually want my rewards card to mean that they know exactly what I'm buying all of the time. It shouldn't just be my responsibility to remember not to use my credit card when I'm buying something embarrassing. So think about what the actual mischief is that you want to resolve and take that to politicians. Make that the conversation, that this is the issue that we need to resolve. It's not a technical problem, it's a people being creepy problem, or whatever the problem is. And that's the way to resolve it. Talk to everyone. When there's a big conversation about this stuff, that's when change happens. And that conversation, I'll say it again, cannot just be a technical conversation. We know that that doesn't work. It didn't work with PGP in 96. It didn't work with the Data Retention Act in 2015. The conversation has to be a policy conversation. And when all else fails, sue the government. That concludes my talk. I think there's some time for questions. Are there any? Two hands up before I started. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, tried to write this down because it was early on. Um, so in a world of a perfectly uh, tech-compatible law, you would have code evaluating behavior and a function that could send you to jail. Yep. Um, I don't like the thought of that, bugs and all. Um, and I do continue to have faith in the courts, mostly, well, at least over in Europe. Um, the, what benefits do you see in, in vague phrasings in the law that are to be interpreted by a judge or a jury? And uh, where would you draw the line? How specific should or can the law be? Uh, look, I could probably write a PhD thesis or two on that question. Uh, it's a really hard question. Yeah, sure, the elevator pitch version. Um, it's really hard. I think it's really important to have vagary in the law sometimes when that vagary is associated with the problem you're trying to solve. So uh, it's fine to say... Uh, I, I actually think, although I've criticised it, the substantial part issue in copyright is a really good example of vagary that's actually really effective. It, uh, it's really hard to know when you've copied a substantial part of something, but it's really good for what the problem that it's trying to solve. It's trying to stop people taking important pieces of material and making a copy of it. Saying we're going to regulate services that enable the use of electromagnetic you know, ways to communicate, that's not helpful. That vagary doesn't address the problem directly. So I think that's where you have to draw the line. Um, I'll also say that I, I, too, have a lot of faith in judges uh, to deal with the procedure and make sure that the procedure is right. But that doesn't mean the outcome is always going to be right. We have to make sure that the law reflects the outcomes we want rather than just focusing on the procedures. Would you be able to speak briefly about um, the source code you failed to get? Uh, yeah, it's written in .NET, no, that's... Uh, 
Uh, the reason I didn't get it was because uh, it was found to be a trade secret. Um, it was a trade secret because the Electoral Commission also makes money by running elections and they use this software to do so. Uh, ultimately, the determining factor, uh, the question that the, the tribunal asked was whether there was a chance, more than a ridiculous or absurd probability, that the Electoral Commission would lose at least a dollar. Um, and they found that there was that chance, and therefore I didn't have access to the code. And it didn't matter that there was a huge public interest in seeing the code, and it didn't matter that the Electoral Commission, uh, you know, its revenue from using the code was about an order of magnitude less than the amount they spent making it. That wasn't the consideration. The only question was whether there was any chance they might lose a buck, literally, uh, and it was found that yes. But we can talk more afterwards if you would like. G'day, Michael. Uh, you said don't ignore the law, comply with it. I was wondering if you thought there was any place for civil disobedience and what shape it might take. The, look. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a lawyer, so... Uh, You're not his lawyer. I'm, I'm not his lawyer, that's true. Uh, as, as a lawyer, I really do believe in the system and using the system to make changes. Um, I don't think that people should ever... Uh, refuse to comply with the law in general. Having said that, civil disobedience has been an effective way to change the law in the past uh, and is sometimes really an important thing to do when the law is actively harmful. You know, to, to take an, a, an absolute extreme example, uh, in Nazi Germany, don't comply with the law. Uh, I think in general, though, we should be trying much harder to work within existing systems rather than using civil disobedience. Thank you, Michael. There were more questions in the audience, I'm sorry, but that our time has uh, elapsed. Uh, are you on the chat list? Uh, I'm on the chat list. I'm on IRC. I'm on Twitter. Thank and you me. can come see me afterwards in the halls and whatever. Thank you. All right, thank you. On behalf...